Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's Astro Coffee Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell, and you guys know that by now, but I have to say it each week because I just want you to know. Um, and I'm from deepastronomy.com, and today we are bringing you another Astro Coffee ha Hangout, or to more, the longer version is the Afternoon Astronomy coffee hangout where we discuss each month or each week uh new papers that have come out in astronomy and i'll let carol explain that to you in just a little bit more but uh but today we're going to be talking about supernovae gravitational lensing and what happens when you see a supernova through the gravitational lens of an object that's in between us and the supernova itself and it turns out some pretty cool things and so uh we're going to uh i'm going to be introducing our guest to you here in just a moment but i want to remind you we are live on three different platforms we are on youtube of course we are also on Periscope, on Periscope Deep Astronomy, as well as on Facebook slash Deep Astronomy. And you can watch us all there. And we have lots of ways you can interact with us, which I will get to in a minute. But before I do, I want to introduce my co-host, Dr. Carol Christian, who is uh, helping me with these. Hi, Carol. How are you? Hey, I'm good. Oh, good. I'm good. That's all awesome. So, good. It's good to I see you. Can about what this is? If you want to, would you please tell our okay. kind viewers what we're doing here? You bet. So in many science departments and many departments, I assume, um, around the world, uh, people get together, especially in astronomy and in science, and we have coffee and we discuss research papers, among other things. So we had the idea, wouldn't that be cool to do that online? But we thought instead of just chatting between Tony and me um, alone, reviewing the papers that we might have seen, we thought we would invite the people who actually did the research. Who yeah, actually interesting. Thought the as idea. interesting as we are, you know, it would be nice to have yeah. Yeah. Week <laughs> after week, maybe not. Um, <laughs> just you and I, I don't know. Anyway, so the idea is that we talk to the people who are actually doing the current research, exciting research with all kinds of telescopes in space, around the world, teams around the world, and trying to get some insight into what were they thinking when they decided to do this research, what they did exactly, and what they concluded, and what they're going to do next. Uh, so we're really fortunate today to have a team who's taking time out of their busy schedules to actually spend some time with us. But it's, it's really fascinating to hear how this is all done. And uh, we also want to thank the American Astronomical Society and the American Astronautical Society, so astronomers and engineers, the professional societies for supporting these hangouts uh, to bring the technology, the science, and the thinking behind astronomical research today. That's right. Good. So, and we are we're, we are looking at all of these live um, ch chat devices that are available to us in this newfangled thing we call the internets and the intertubes. And today I actually have some help. For the first time I have, uh, I, I have a, an internet driver for me who is actually helping me monitor a lot of these uh, uh, social media channels. So we are, I am looking at the live chat on YouTube and already I see the, I see Kenneth Gil Kilgore who's saying, hi, Carol, uh, Galaxia, others are also, uh, are, are, are here. Uh, John Suffle, a lot of other people who watch. So thank you guys. I'm looking right at you now. And the, um, but we're also now, thank you to, thanks to Carl monitoring better the Facebook page and, and the, uh, Astro Coffee hashtag on Twitter. So please, do that. He will also uh, be live tweeting uh, some of these, uh, some of the comments of our guests today as well. So thank so you. So Carl's the man behind the curtain. He's the man behind the <laughs> curtain. That's right. You don't see him right now. But later we'll be talking to him about it, seeing if he sees anything. All right. So let's let's get to uh, let let me get to our guest today. I'm going to just go from left, my left to right. I don't know how it appears on their screens, but uh, joining me is uh, Dr. Ariel Gubar. He's from the University of Stockholm. Welcome, Ariel. Thank you. Nice to have coffee with you. Yes. That, oh, you brought your coffee. That's very mm -hmm. good. It's Florida here, so I've got iced tea. But uh, also joining me is Dr. <laughs> Dr. Mansi Casalval. Did I, scoot her, did I mess it up? Uh, hi, Mansi. It's well, welcome. She's from the uh, California Institute of Technology. Welcome. Hi, happy to be here. Thank you, Mansi. Also joining me is Dr. Peter Nugent from the University of California at Berkeley. Although, did I hear you say you're at Fermilab right now? I am at Fermilab right now. <laughs> okay, so welcome. Yep. Traveling the room. 
Now, these are, these are the guys who wrote the paper we're going to be talking about today, and I just want to say that they, if you want to follow along, I put a link to the paper uh, in the description box, so feel free to click on it, download it, follow along, ask your questions. I've got a few diagrams to show you, but I'm sure there'll be more in there, uh, and we'll look at your questions and comments as we go. Okay, so here we are. We're talk- uh, I'm going to... I'm going to ask, uh, who sh- which one of you wants to give us a summary of what you, your research is all about? Which one? Who well, I can to- start if you want. Okay, uh, go ahead, Ariel. Right, so, so uh, the uh, discovery which we'll be talking about, uh, it came about from a, a very ambitious uh, survey of this guy, which we're doing, we have been doing for many years, and Mansi and Peter actually were there long before me doing this, which is taking place at Palomar, our pa- Palomar Transient factory and we look for things that vary in the sky uh, and we have different interests in what in the sky is varying that we care about uh, me in particular I, I really care about this type 1a supernovae that we use to measure distances and some of you might remember that those are the objects that were used to discover that the expansion of the universe is acceler- accelerating and in the process of, of disco- looking for things that vary in the sky Occasionally, we find very odd things that uh, vary in the sky. And the reason we can find very odd things in the sky is because we look over very large chunks of the sky, unlike any other or most other uh, surveys. So we have, a, you know, we have a good chance to find weird things because we look at a lot of places. And so what, what telescopes uh, do you use to look at ch- things that change in the sky? So maybe Mansi wants to take this Okay, one. go ahead, Mansi. <laughs> Um, sure. So we begin our discovery engine is the Samuel Austin 48 inch telescope on Palomar Mountain. Um, so this is our big eye. This has the wide field. This is what's making a movie of the sky. And this is what we are looking at to search for, discover new flashes of light. Um, but as soon as the telescope has done its work of, of finding, identifying the new object, then there's a set of telescopes around the world that we use. Um, that we link together with a fun acronym, as with many contrived acronyms in astronomy, called GROWTH. They're not contrived, no. Uh. (laughs) That stands for the Global Relay of Observatories Watching Transients Happen. And this is just a bunch of astronomers around the world uh, with uh, their favorite, with many different telescopes, some doing spectroscopy, some doing photometry, some getting radio data, some getting X-ray data, um, to understand and characterize what did we just find. I mean, going beyond the step of, okay, something came out of the night sky that wasn't there the night before, but what is it? So are these telescopes wide field? Do they, do they look at large areas of the sky at one time? Nope, the follow-up telescopes all have a pretty pencil beam field of view um, because the 48-inch Palomar telescope, the Samuel Austin telescope, already tells us where to look. So we have a very precise position on the sky from the 48-inch. Um, so the rest of the follow-up is point But the 48-inch, uh, that one's wide field, right? That one is super wide field. Now, why do you... So is that because, and I'm just backing up here because I want to make sure viewers can understand what you're doing. You're starting with a telescope that can see a lot of the sky at once, mm-hmm. but but it's still very accurate in being able to see changes in brightness of things, right? And then based on that, you pinpoint a location and then zoom in, am I right, uh, with these other telescopes? Right. So it's like making a movie of the sky, and we compared the image that we got tonight from the image from last night and say, hey, here's a star that we didn't see last night. Uh, but each of our pixels in that camera are about an arc second. Mm-hmm. So we can get very precise sub arc second positions of any new thing that we discover in those images. And one arc second is just a little tiny angle in the sky of which there are 3,600 of those in a degree, uh, squared, in a square degree of the sky. So, and, and the moon is about a half a degree, right? Right. So that gives you guys some kind of idea of what what size we're talking about. Super super tiny. How big of the how big of, how much of the sky can the forty eight inch see? Um, so Peter, do you want to take that one? Yeah. So so to give everybody an idea, uh, an arc second is about the uh, width of a the diameter of a dime, a U.S. dime, at one mile. Okay, or a euro at two kilometers. Oh, I can see those. I check those out. <laughs> Yeah. I've so, got really big retinas, uh, okay? We, we cover over uh, seven square degrees, so you're looking at something 
that's about the size of, um, oh, 15 to 20 full moons yep, that uh, makes stacked sense. together. Sure. If the yeah. moon is a half a degree, that makes sense, sure. So, as, but so that's only one minute. That's one minute. Seconds. So you're look. I'm sorry, say that again. What's one minute? One exposure is one minute long. So we hit that. And we usually do two observations a night on the same field because we want to get rid of things like asteroids which move or find them, if you will. Uh, and we probably do around 300 total pointings, so 150 unique pointings. So multiply that 150 by 7, and you can see we cover uh, over 1,000 square degrees every night. Now, I want to get I want to get back to your observation uh, uh, here in just a sec, but uh, this idea of trans I, I guess it's called what's it called um, uh, transitional astronomy or 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 uh, things that that aren't that you know uh, things that either move in the sky or get brighter in the sky. That's a pretty new area of astronomy, isn't it? I mean, it, it didn't used to be that the thought was that the night sky was all that dynamic things seem to almost always stay the same now we've got all these we were looking at at uh at uh, uh changes in brightness and we're looking at galaxies move we're looking at supernovae expand so this idea is a pretty new one relatively speaking isn't it as as our as our uh tel as our telescopes and our detectors have gotten better is that yeah, that's that's true. Uh, if you look at how supernova were discovered, say even 20, 20 years ago, um, and and these are the the nearby supernova, the ones occurring that you could see on a small telescope, uh, they were mostly discovered by amateurs, uh, and you would find probably on the order of about uh, forty supernova a year, and and that was fairly constant from the nineteen twenties all the way until the early 1990s. And it was at that point that people started doing dedicated digital searching in the sky. Uh, and then the numbers started to ramp up dramatically. And I would say PTF is uh, certainly the, the most successful of the uh, wide field uh, surveys uh, that's been out there. How long has it been around? I've, I've never, I'm not, I don't believe I'm familiar with it. You want to take that, Monty? Sure. So the Palma Transient Factory began in 2009. Okay. And has been running ever since. Um, and just right now, we've actually um, uh, taken the camera off the telescope and we're going to put a brand new, even bigger camera on the telescope um, called the Zwicky Transient Facility. And this camera will make a movie of the sky a factor of 12 faster than the current one because it's even more pixels, even more silicon. Um, it's filling out the entire focal plane of this telescope with detectors. Wow. And we're looking again at about 24 square degrees at once. Is that what, is that what uh, Peter said? Uh, 47 uh, is what we're doing. 47, what we sorry. just finished with, and now we're going to 47. But the exposures will be shorter. We'll move from 60 seconds down to 30 seconds. So the, the total survey area, as Monty said, goes up by over an order of magnitude. Okay. Wow. So That's amazing. Basically, every hour we can do 3,750 square degrees. So it's super fast. We run out of sky to observe in a few hours. Wow. Okay. Well, you guys are like, I've, I've heard all these stories about LSST, but you guys already have that covered. You guys are already doing all this stuff. That's awesome. Um, okay. Well, let's get to We're your... We're going to do all the cool science before... <laughs> <laughs> Good, yeah. Oh, it, uh, we, you know, you could LSST, LSST comes There's online. There's a line in the sand. <laughs> I, hey, I drew it. I drew it many, many years ago. Yeah, I'm yeah. happy to yep. stand by it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's get to your observation. The one that, the, of this particular supernova that we that the paper is written about. I'm going to start with a question from Adam Synergy, and then I'm going to follow up. Was the supernova first spotted in image data by a human? Or an algorithm. So, who wants to talk about a little bit in general case uh, the this observation that we're that your paper is on uh, right now? Maybe I can start. Um, so, um, do you, do you have a picture up there, Tony, uh, or can you put up the first one? I um, uh, sure can. Let me do that. 
Go ahead. So and it's stop. just just again to give some some picture to what uh, Mansi and and Peter were just saying. So what you see the big picture when you see all the dots uh, and stuff. These are galaxies and stars, and you see one out of the twelve chips of the camera. So that gives you an idea. Every thirty seconds, we look at our look at the patch of the sky, which is twelve times larger than uh, that you see here, and. Naturally, we find lots and lots and lots of, of things that vary in the sky. Some are real and some are, are just, you know, mis something that where the computer finds, which is not real, but something that actually, something in the image that just went wrong. So, of course, we need, humans cannot do this. You know, humans cannot go through dot by dot in this image and figure out what's changing. We definitely need software. To, to pick things up. So when you were asking a few minutes a few minutes ago, you know, what what about the sudden change? change and how far is it so it was in about it was in october 2nd and i know it vividly because it was a sunday i was uh, supposed to be in the french riviera and i wasn't i was at home uh, because something happened uh, and i'm looking at the data and i see the spectrum coming from from the uh, the you know the p6 the next telescope in the mountain that takes the spectrum i i could tell that this was very unusual because the spectrum of this object were, from which we get the distance was telling us this, this way was far, was much further than anything we have found, uh, any type 1A supernova we have found with this instrument. That immediately told us that there was something exciting or potentially something exciting going on. Awesome. Okay. Uh, well, let's see. The um, So the, uh, where did we get this back off? So uh, when you said yourself, that, just talk a little bit about the supernova itself, because you mentioned it earlier in the uh, in the hangout that this was a Type One A supernova. Now, this is a special kind of supernova because um, because it is a what's called a standard candle. These are things that we, we that, that if you know their intrinsic brightness, this is the thing that it, the brightness of it is if it's right next to you, and then you measure something far away, you can kind of calculate the distance based on that brightness change. Can you maybe put that in slightly better words? Tell us a little bit about Type 1A supernovae. Right. So so Type 1A supernovae are probably the uh, neatest objects, well, the neatest objects I know about, <laughs> at least in astronomy, in the sense, as, as you say, we happen to know that every time they explode, they put out the same amount of light or nearly about the same amount of light, regardless of where they explode. 
And since we measure the light arriving to Earth, and we know how much, you know, how much light was in the original explosion, we can figure out how far the galaxy where the supernova exploded is. And uh, this has been beautifully exploited. And Peter and I were part of the team that exploited this to discover the expansion that the expansion of the universe has been accelerating. That's the uh, Nobel Prize, uh, 2011. So indeed, you know, um, this it's it's the only object we know about that actually works that way, and it's only because of that, pro- that property we could tell right away that this object we've seen tons of those with other telescopes at, at that particular redshift, but this one was fifty times brighter than any of the ones we've seen at that redshift, which implied that something was making this object looked 50 times brighter than it had been, had nothing been in, you know, some, nothing been there uh, to, to lens it, as we call it. Okay, hold, hold, hold on just a quick second. Make sure, make sure I got this. So you observed a supernova that, because of its type, it's a type 1A, it's a standard candle, it's something that we know its intrinsic brightness, how bright it should be. You're saying that you saw this supernova, how big, 50 times brighter? That's right. So the way then it we... should have been. Well, so one of two things was going on, right? Either it's being boosted somehow, or you, it's you're wrong about how far away it is. Exactly. Exactly. So, okay. and, and of course, this, for this, the second thing you mentioned was the first idea. The first idea we had is well, something is wrong about the redshift. So we immediately got more redshifts, uh, more observations of the redshift. Excuse me, uh, and you know, it was beautifully confirmed. So we got you know a second one, a third one, and so on. And so more forth. observations from redshifts from what? From the same supernova, you know, the supernova keeps getting brighter and brighter, you know, and then eventually fades. So, but you can follow it and get more and more observations where you actually split the light into the um, into the wavelengths, and you do see, you know, atomic lines, transitions where you know exactly where it should be, and they are consistently shifted towards longer wavelengths. That's what we call redshift. That's what we do routinely to figure out, you know, essentially how much smaller the universe was when the light started to travel towards us okay so uh, larry keese is just asking and i and i'd like to know this too does the gravitational lensing effect cause a change to the redshift at all you said it was brighter and you got a lot of other observations uh of this thing to make sure that you were right about its distance but does the lensing affect that it does, certainly it affects the brightness but what about the redshift? right no that that's a great question but you know just to remind everyone what lensing is so lensing is focusing of light um just like the, an optical lens works, you know, it, it doesn't change the color of the light. It really, or... The Shall I show that really... animation while you're talking? Yes, please do. Okay. Um, okay, I think I've got it. Go ahead, and, and it's, it's playing so, while you're talking. So, lensing is what we call achromatic. So, it has, has actually, it's, it only has to do with the curvature of space-time. This is sort of one of the fundaments, you know, fundamental, the, one of the pillars in, in Einstein's theory of general relativity and it does nothing to the wavelength, therefore it does nothing to the redshift, uh, but it does a lot about positioning, you know, where the thing, the image is, and how bright it is. Okay, so, and here we're looking at what you guys, now in this animation that I'm showing, we're seeing the, they we're seeing a galaxy that exists between the, that's sitting between the Earth and the supernova itself, and we're seeing light rays that as it's coming from the supernova get bent around the galaxy where the galaxy is acting as a lens like we're talking about. But I'm also seeing four dots in this. Is that what you guys observed? That's right. That's right. But not at, not, not at first. And I think this is very important to point out. And I think at some point Peter will follow up on that. But at first we did not see that, right? Because at first we only had the images from Palomar. And if you are still, do you still have the image? Uh, well, if you still have the image with the lots of, you know, all the galaxies, the big, uh, the figure there, you can see that the uh, resol- the angular resolution of the images from Palomar, uh, even though Mansi said it was great, you know, we had the great, you know, spatial position, it's not great enough, you know, because it's only an arc second or a couple of arc seconds. Well, this, for, to see these four images. We needed to go to instruments which had resolution which were, you know, at least 10 times better or about 10 times better. So that's, so the cool thing here is that we were able to detect a 
you know, a, an effect that actually m you know, moved around the images by a tiny fraction of an arc second, but because it was a standard candle, we could still figure out that that was going on, and then we used Hubble Space Telescope and, you know, very high spatial resolution imaging from Keck that Mansi can tell you more about to actually see the four images which we predicted, or at least two or more could be there. We predicted it had to be more than one, and, and again, we could then zoom in with a big scope with very, 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 very focused uh, imaging, but with very you know, exquisite angular resolution. Okay, so what I'm doing, because this image is so big in the, uh, in the uh, frame and it's squished up a lot of the text, I've zoomed in a little bit. So I see the little square that you guys observed from, and then it goes up to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey where there's a little square in there that says 10 right. arc seconds. Right exactly. next to it is a lensing galaxy. That's the galaxy in the second panel that is doing the lensing. And that's taken from a Hubble, it looks like, Whitefield Camera 3. And then also from Whitefield Camera 3 is the lens supernova at a slightly different wavelength. You can see that in the F814W filter. And then Keck, in the final panel, has observed a, the galaxy also uh, with the supernova in it. It looks about the same as the panel before that. So this is the supernova as viewed through... Um, oops, hold on just a sec. I need to also do this so that it <coughs> goes through. This is the supernova as viewed through the uh, Hubble and Keck uh, instruments, the, NR, the NIRC2, which I imagine is near CAM2 for them, the, the J-band. So um, so this is what you saw. So let me, um, let me ask you, um, uh, Mansi, uh, was this, was this um, observation particularly uh surprising to you was it is this is this a common kind of thing that people see when you're looking for transients in the sky <laughs> it's like it's exactly the opposite uh, so <laughs> when, when ariel first saw the spectrum is like he sent me the signal saying this may be something we should start to get excited about you know there's this crazy idea that even though we found thousands of type 1e supernovae that have been very faithful in terms of you know how bright they are given the redshift this one was not making sense and he's like it just might be that there's this very, very small chance that the galaxy, that this other lensing galaxy just happened to be in the line of sight between us and the supernova and creating this magnification. Um, I mean, this was the, the, this is the first example that we have of a strongly lensed, multiply imaged type 1A uh, supernova. And we, this is not the first type 1A supernova we found. We really have found a few thousand by now. So, Lens, do you mean? Uh, no, no, a few thousand ordinary Type oh. 1A supernovae um, with the Palma Transient Factory. And this was the first one that we saw that was actually strong enough, so strongly enough lens that we could see the multiple images um, with Keck and with uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. So out of, out of a few thousand that you've already seen, this is, this is the first one. So, that's, that, no, that, no. so that is pretty rare. So can you give me some idea what you learn from a supernova that has been lensed, I mean, presumably you have more signal. Let I me mean, to give you guys an example. The Hubble, the Hubble Space Telescope just finished a program called Frontier Fields, where they used galaxy clusters to make Hubble essentially more powerful, to make it be able to see things it wouldn't ordinarily be uh, powerful enough to see. Very, very faint, far away things, uh, which means there's more signal there for it to see. So presumably, uh, Mansi, and correct me if I'm wrong, anybody on the panel, uh, if I look at one of these supernovae through a lens of through a galaxy lens or gravitational lens i get more signal maybe more information i can learn about this supernova Is, am, I, am i right i would say much more than that i mean you can uh, but let me i think let me defer to the expert here which is either peter or ariel to answer exactly what we can learn about gra okay. gravity and any, cosmology any comment peter yeah so um let's uh, th there are two things so yes you can do exactly what you just said and i have a feeling uh given this new method which we can talk about later that lsst will be using gravitationally lens supernova to expand their reach um as if I they think need LS it. <laughs> yeah exactly um and and so uh, it's it's one good possibility where you can see this one got a factor of 50 boost maybe more common would be around 
10 or 15 or something like that. But that really can double the distance that you're looking uh, at objects. And so that will, be, that will be interesting. But the much more powerful thing that we can do with it is to do, um, uh, make a new type of measurement for cosmology. And so cosmology uh, with standard type 1A supernova is all about using the fact that um, there are a particular brightness. We know what that brightness is. We can, you know, read the wattage on the light bulb as it is. And we use the inverse square law, and that tells us how far away it is. Um, but gravitational lenses do something which is, which is quite spectacular. So you see those four images there. And you can see the fact that the, the light is being bent around the galaxy. And it's not perfect. Those paths have different lengths. And it just has to do with exactly where the supernova is lined up with that galaxy. And so one path length can be longer than another. Well, an interesting thing then happens. The light from the path that's longer takes longer to reach us. And so if we can measure when one supernova comes on in an image and find that, and then see the next supernova come on and find that, all of a sudden we now know something about the relative distance between ourselves, the lens, and where the supernova is. All and we can actually- All paths are different? All because Yep, of and, and it's just time delay because the speed of light is fixed. And so all we're doing is really measuring the relative distances now between us and the lens and the supernova. And it's exquisitely accurate. Type 1A supernova have this great property. Their light curves are so well behaved that we can actually measure where a light curve, say, peaks or falls to just a few hours. And these delays, these path lengths, which are different, can be days long. And so you can wind up measuring relative differences in the distances to, to a fraction of a percent which is unheard of in cosmology. And so that's where the big payoff comes in. And what are you measuring the differences to? I, I mean, to, to within 1%. Is it the galaxy in the middle or is it the supernova itself? I, I'm, the I'm distance, having trouble understanding, but I want to back up in a minute because I'm right as we're talking, okay. I'm showing this animation on a loop. And I want to be clear that everybody, that when you see those three dots at the end of the animation... Uh, where you those are actually three different images of the same event. That's not those are those are those. That's not the same event split up. It's the same event in three different locations because the light paths that Peter was talking about are different. What are you getting to within one percent? The distance to the supernova or the distance to the lens that you that is doing the lensing? You actually get a, a relative distance to the lens and to the supernova simultaneously so you get both oh okay nice. so it's, it's it's so think of it because the path is different from the supernova to where the lens is and then when it bends and comes back those path links can be different too so you actually get something that tells you about the distance to both uh, to both of them maybe i could add a few words to that uh, yeah. uh, i i feel kind of strongly about this this is a Actually, this original discovery of this technique uh, was something that happened uh, in my neighboring country here in Norway. It was an astronomer by the name of Sjöbrev Stahl, which he wanted to see this happen. He described this in 1964, and he explained, you know, uh, uh, more or less what Peter was trying to say, that if you are able to capture this a scenario like this one, where we are able to measure the time difference it takes of the light starting from the same source, but going through different paths in the universe, if you can capture that, well, actually what you're measuring, Tony, is more than just a distance between us and the supernova. You're actually measuring the expansion rate of the universe. You're measure, making an, an absolute measurement of the length scale of the universe because it's the time difference, if you think about it, is like if I run two blocks uh, you know, around, the, uh, around my house, uh, and, and and I run it, you know, slightly different paths. I will get a, probably, you know, maybe a few seconds difference. But if I run two miles with and plus some extra turn, of course, it will be hours difference between my two paths. And the same is true. The same thing happens here. Depending on how big the different paths are, you get to know 
how big the universe is really in absolute terms. You know how okay, much. Okay, okay. Whoa, 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 whoa. You got your your. So in the time difference between the two paths, one is an hour different than the other. You're getting some sense of the, the large scale of, structure of the, of the, the universe. Of the universe. Yeah, of the actual size of the universe, and that the actual size of the universe. <laughs> I'll say that again. Actually, by the looking at the two paths differences of the rays coming around the galaxy. Rest. Uh, and knowing and knowing the redshift, knowing the redshift where the the source is and where the lens is, uh, Shu Restall in 1964 explained how you can figure out measured expansion rate of the universe because it's an absolute measurement of distance scales. Did yes. you guys do that with this with this supernova? Okay, so so we are trying to. Um, the, the we need more data. We need, need more, data. more data. Oh, that's the yeah. Of course. <laughs> No, I, I, no I, actually, we I, just I, need I, one more data. Yeah, uh, no, I, I doubt that. But uh, uh, anyway, Which I was going to say Which also part? that they only need one more data. Ah. Um, that, that the other thing that that uh, is a question actually. So part of the power of this technique is because the supernova, which you said before, changes. If it was just sitting there the same all the time. You wouldn't be able to tell the time difference. Exactly. You actually exactly. need to right. see the fact that it, you know the supernova gets brighter, 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 right. and so one yeah. little piece starts to get bright, and then the second piece gets bright, and then the third one gets bright, and they're going because the light is going different paths. Exactly. But the supernova is just getting bright by itself. And right, so Carol. I, I think you one, exactly put the finger on the key issue here. Because if it, if it didn't vary, it would just be sitting exactly. there emitting, and then you would right. say, okay, you, there it is. You need, this, you need a transient object, like a supernova, uh, to, in order to do this. Um, one more cool thing, actually, there's something that I think maybe was not mentioned, uh, which I think is, is critical to know also why this is interesting, is like, this is the first time, you know, I, I said like, no, this thing has been magnified by 50 times, and, and Peter confirmed that, likely, that's good. Um, Thank you, Peter. Uh, so, but this is the first time we actually we can claim that, because there are a lot of lens systems, and we can only model, you know, we can only use modeling to figure out how powerful the lens is. But this time, there's no modeling at all. We're just comparing how bright this supernova is with all the hundreds we have at the same redshift. So this is actually the first time we can start to probe gravity with, in a very model-independent way, which is the other thing. In addition to Peter said about measuring, and I said about measuring the expansion rate of the universe, this is an, 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 an amazing step forward in, in our ability to probe, you know, the fact that you know, matter curves space-time. You know, we, are, we can actually tell this exactly how yeah, much... There's a really key point here is that we're not only learning more about the supernova, we're not only learning more about how the universe expands, but because of the lens, we're learning a lot about how matter and dark matter, for that matter, um, behave in these galaxies which are acting like lenses at scales which we just never can, can really look at. So it, it really opens up a lot of new areas if we can find more of these. And I don't, I don't know if people have looked much at the frontier fields, but I mean they're beautiful fields. But the lens models, I mean, there are whole groups of people constantly, feverishly working away about the lenses because they're trying to identify the many, many objects in the field, the many, many objects causing the lens. So you've got many, many parameters. And the beauty of this observation is that it's, it, it's pretty. Straightforward, which are, is are you guys doing yeah. that? Nice. Are you guys using lens models similar or than well, as the Frontier Fields guys are doing? Are you guys? Yeah, you know, we we still you know we still model what that lensing galaxy has to look like in order to produce the four images that we see, right? I mean, there is a modeling involved to figure out the positions. Uh, that that is fine, is but but that's that's a separate story. Now that we want to understand how massive this thing is and compare it with the you no know, from the model and compare it with the uh, actual measurement from the supernova boosting of the light, right? So there we can but actually. It, it is much much easier than what they're doing with these clusters, which are causing the lensing. Because you guys have one galaxy, right? We just have one galaxy. It's that's easier it. To, it's easier to model that as a lens because it's just one thing. Was this dead behind it? I mean, we in our little animation here, we've been showing the the supernova as being directly between the or the galaxy as being directly in between us and the supernova. Was that the case in this paper? Right. So let me then add one more 
thing which is very puzzling to me at least. I mean, think uh, uh, just an idea. So it, it's so aligned. I mean, the reason it, it's, it's 50 times brighter is just because it's so amazingly lined up. Just to give you an idea, so Peter was saying that, well, you know, we could have found one which is five times, 95 by five times. Um, and, but we didn't. We found one which is 95 by 50 times. And, you know, that's a thousand times more unlikely. So that's something that really puzzles me about the discovery is... How bright it was. How bright it was. Yeah. Why have we found this guy 95, 50 times and we haven't found a single one, you know, or maybe, you know, at least I don't think we have found a single one magnified only about five times, which is a thousand times more likely. You know, it's, it's, uh, I think it's pointing to something, I think either we're just amazingly lucky, or it's pointing that there's something about the bending of light that needs to be, uh, we need to think a bit more about. I don't know how you're saying it's more 5,000 or 1,000 times more likely, because how do you know that? I mean, it, so much has to come up to make it bright. Oh, no, it, has to, it has to do exactly with the alignment. You say, you think about what is the likelihood of finding something you know, getting a bullseye or getting a, a, a three or a four, right? I mean, if yeah. you think about darts, uh, <laughs> it's, it's much more likely to get something off the center. That's when I center. play. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, okay. <laughs> all right. Well, all right. I, I guess I see that. Okay. I'm going to leave this topic in a minute, but I want to make sure I understand what you just said about, because I'm going to ask a uh, Yurik Mazino's question here in just a second. Because and Carol pointed it out, because parts of the supernova are leaving at different time, or are they're leaving at the same time, but they're traveling in different paths around the lensed galaxy, the galaxy doing the lensing. You're able because of that time difference, the difference in paths, the longer it takes to go around one path than another, understand the the expansion rate of the universe based on those differences in time. Correct. Wow. Okay, all right. I'm going to leave that and go now to Yurik uh, Mazino, who is asking, what have we learned about dark matter from this lensed 1A, type 1A supernova? Is the data still being analyzed? So, do you have like a dark matter map? We've seen those in, play, in, in, in similar sorts of observations. What have you learned about dark matter? Well, I don't know if... Uh, yeah, I, I can say a few words and others can fill in. I mean, uh, I, I think I was hinting at that. So I, I don't know what we're learning about, but we're learning about that um, certainly this did not follow our expectations. I mean, it's hard to tell from one event, right? It's, it's hard to tell if from one event you understand the, the uh, properties of something global like dark matter. But if we just run a simulation of uh, our survey and try to figure out what would be the likelihood of finding something like what we did? Well, that's very, very unlikely. Whether it has to do with what dark matter is or it has to do with something else, I think it's, too premature. it's, it's premature to say. But certainly, uh, the moment we start getting more events like this one, and I think Peter can explain why we think we will get many more, I think we will be able to come up with interesting answers. I think based on one object, I wouldn't go as far as say we, we know what the explanation is. It, it's very, very bizarre, but I wouldn't go as far as say that I understand what exactly caused it, this bizarre behavior. Yeah, we do have a really interesting data point. I mean, Ariel mentioned how close in to the core of this galaxy it was. It was, uh, you know, 0.3 arc seconds. Um, and and this is this is basically we're we're looking at a galaxy that's a couple billion light years away, and we're resolving the inner kiloparsec of the galaxy, and uh, you know, in terms of where the mass is distributed. Uh, but we're going to get a lot. We need to get a lot more of these to figure out if what we saw is common. Is it uncommon? Is it caused by other things? And and. That's sort of where we're headed next. Okay, that was going to be my next question. How how more of these do you expect to see? And the answer is you don't know. You, I guess you need to. Oh, we, we've made so so. I when I started literally just days after Ariel said, I think we found a gravitationally lensed supernova. I started thinking about this, and we came up with a simple, very very simple strategy for finding more. And so now we have a very good estimate of how we're going to find these. So so this guy got magnified, and I started thinking about. How could we find more of these? Because they're brighter than they should be. So three very simple things happen. Type 1A supernova, we know exactly how bright they should be. There are these standard candles. Um, the galaxies which do the lensing are elliptical galaxies. There's a very, very neat thing about the elliptical galaxies, which is their, their spectrum has a very 
definitive shape to it, which allows us just through photometry to measure its redshift. So in essence, we know how far away that elliptical galaxy is. And by photometry, you mean looking at that elliptical galaxy in different wavelengths, different filters, yeah. and filters. based on how brighter, how brighter, how dim it is in those filters, you can tell its redshift. I can tell its redshift. Um, and, and put those two together, and then the one other fact, elliptical galaxies only host type 1a supernova. So if we see something explode in an elliptical galaxy, it has to be a type 1a supernova. Because I it's an elliptical galaxy, we know the Yeah, because it's an elliptical galaxy, we know the distance to it. And because of that, we know how bright that object should become because all it can be is a type 1a supernova that rises to a certain brightness. Well, I know elliptical galaxies are very old, yeah. they're very large, and you're yeah. telling me now and the the yep. stars the star birth is basically not happening in these galaxies anymore. Exactly. And so the only type of supernova that you will see in an elliptical galaxy is a the type one A. Yep. Yeah, there are some oddballs, but they're very very faint. Monsi knows all about those. Those are her pride and joy. Um, <laughs> but but they're faint. The brightest ones that occur are type one normal type one A's, and they're the vast I majority did not of the know ones that, that That's there. amazing. What are the other kind, Monsi? So, you, oh, so there are the more no. exotic, rare classes of transients, which happen, you know, maybe 10% the rate of type 1e supernovae, but where you could have, say, a helium white dwarf exploding instead of a carbon oxygen white dwarf exploding, or you could have a accretion induced collapse of a white dwarf into a neutron star, all kinds of exotic things, uh, which are much, much rarer than than type 1e supernovae. The type 1e supernovae are my fog. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Well, I go go ahead, Peter. I, I interrupted you because I just needed to see. Yeah. I didn't need to hear. Oh, you. Yeah. Go ahead and finish your thought. So, so this is the thing. So the fog now for gravitationally lens supernova are type one a supernova that occur in that potential lens galaxy. So what happens when you find a supernova that's brighter than it should be? And this is an odd thought because Ariel told you this supernova was fifty times brighter than it should be. It's actually so bright, even though it was twice as far away from us as the lens, it was so magnified that if it was a normal type 1a supernova, it would have been halfway between the lens and us. So that's how much it got magnified by. So if we find something which is brighter than a type 1a in an elliptical galaxy, it has to be a lensed type 1a supernova behind it. And that's all it can be. So we've now done the rates, and the Zwicky Transient Facility, which is coming up in the next year, should find about 10 of these per year. And LSST should find on the order of 100 of these per year. And what's the normal... Do we have a rate, a supernova rate per year in the universe of Type 1A supernova? Oh, yes. Uh, so... Zwicky Transient Facility, all told, should probably be finding somewhere on the order of, oh, I'm going to guess about 50,000 Type 1As. Now, it won't get spectra of all of them. It won't do a lot of them, but it, those will be there. 50,000 per year per universe. <laughs> <laughs> okay wow okay that's i learned a lot just right there that was an amazing exchange thank you very much um okay well going back to the galaxy itself ben bob harkins is asking is there any record of a supernova actually in that galaxy for direct comparison because we're talking about the galaxy the lensing galaxy you said it's elliptical the only ones that happen in those galaxies are type 1a have we do we have we ever seen a supernova come from that galaxy no, I mean, you have to remember that uh, in a typical galaxy, there is like one type 1A supernova every 500 years. So, you know, it would be, that would be very, very strange if in addition to this, we would have had also <laughs> another supernova. Then I would have say, something would say, these guys are just crazy. You're that, the luckiest so astronomers. <laughs> uh -huh. So, no, the answer, we, but, but actually, no, but just to remind everyone, it, it is, these guys are standard candles, you know, the, I can show you one, two, three, thousands of those. They all look the same. So there's not that we need to find one in that particular galaxy to know what it should look like. There, you know, there, there's nothing special about it. It's just a redshift. We know the redshift and that's it. They all look the same. Okay, Andrew, I want to get to some more questions. Um, I, I'm going to ask Andrew Planet's question and then I'm going to go to Carl. Um, 
Andrew Planet is asking, is the reason for the different times that Carol was talking about in the, in the paths and stuff that you guys were mentioning, uh, is the reason for the different times the light arrives to our point of view due to the supernova not being directly behind the galaxy lens? We talked about that briefly. So let's see. So, so um, we were saying, I'm not sure if I, I actually did understand the nuance of this particular question, but we were saying that if we look at the image, there are four images of the supernova. They did not have to be as nicely you know, lined up as the one we have here. In, in, in principle, one could be more to the sides. In principle, this is light emitted from the supernova, and it's bent back towards us. And there's no reason why the bending has to be identical for all four images, right? They could be... So the reason they arrive at different times is two, actually. One is that the... Uh, they don't have identical paths, you know, on either side of the galaxy. And because they don't have identical paths, they're also affected differently by the gravitational time dilation as they, the light has as it gets near the lens. So there are two things. One is the path length, and the other one is that time near this massive lens gets goes slower. But, but it, both effects come from the fact that the, the four right paths it would be remarkable if they are all, if they are identically long. You know, they're just they just cannot be. You know. Okay, so Carl, I'm going to go to you now. Uh, do you have anything uh, anything from Twitter or in, in, in Facebook to, to ask? Um, I don't have anything from Twitter, uh, and on Facebook, they're asking about the. Andrew Planet was asking about the same thing about the differences in the time of the curves. Oh, okay. Like so we got to Andrew's. We got to Andrew's yeah, question. I, I have a quick question. There was also one in um, the feed about the rates of supernova as it relates to the total amount of uh, uh, matter in the universe. And if we know the rates, does that mean we know that the total amount of matter in the universe is a certain amount or is finite? Anybody? Oh, Monty, you're all over that. Uh... Um, I, I would say, I mean, the accuracy to which we know the rates is, um, it, it's always as a function of the amount of stellar mass in the universe, as well as the amount of star formation that in the universe. And uh, the accuracy to which we know the rates is, um, especially of type 1A supernovae, is, um, is is pretty good. It's a, it's the best rate that we have, but... Uh, um, I, I, I think it's um, the the accuracy with which we know stellar mass and star formation is comparable. So it's not um, it's not a big effect here, the uncertainty in um, in the stellar mass and star formation compared to the uncertainty in the rate number itself. So okay, uh, Larry Keese has a good question that um, about the lensing of the of an elliptical galaxy because elliptical galaxies are. Pretty, I think they're spherical, if I'm, uh, or at least they're pretty. They certainly don't have as much um, they're, detail. They're elliptical, right? But, <laughs> yeah, I mean, all, all elliptical <laughs> but what I mean is they're they are they're they're a uniform, relatively uniform shape. <laughs> so, does that mean that an elliptical galaxy is a better lens than, say, a uh, a Milky Way galaxy or they, a spiral galaxy? Because Larry Keith, his actual question is. The lens is close to perfect with an elliptical galaxy. So the, how is the shape affecting how it's, good of a lens it is? It's, it's much, much better in an elliptical galaxy. Other galaxies can do it. Uh, there, there are two problems. One is that the matter is sort of spread out all over the place. So that really mucks up what your underlying lens looks like. So, so that's the first part is the lens is not as effective in other galaxies compared to an elliptical uh, the second thing is, is that if you look at these light paths, they cut very close to the cores of these galaxies. And if you're going through an elliptical, as you said, they're, they're filled with a bunch of dead old stars, and they've eaten up a lot of the gas and the dust that's in them. And that's really good, because if the path goes through near the core, there's not much gas or dust there to obscure it. Whereas if you tried lensing with the Milky Way galaxy at about that same distance out, 
you would plow through so much gas and dust that instead of having any benefit of the magnification of gravitational lensing, you'd eat it all the way through all the extinction due to dust that you would build up. So there, there are two reasons why the ellipticals are much, much better. Okay. Uh, and, I, and I just wanted to quickly add to that that, you know, I mean, um, this also makes for a really beautiful image. Um, I was sitting in the control room of Keck when we were getting this, firing this laser, correcting for adaptive optics and getting this image. And it's just absolutely mind blowing that without doing any analysis, any reduction, as the image read out, you could actually see the Einstein ring, the four images, the lens, the host galaxy, the lens galaxy. And wow, it's all right there with no processing at all. You just you just saw the image read out, read out, and, and that image that you see. I mean, it's very very little processing. It's just it's just oh, mind blowing. It's so yeah. beautiful. There's nothing like sitting at a telescope. Is there? I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. there, I see two questions here. One that I think is pretty interesting, just because I saw in a documentary that this might be how the cloud that formed our star was made, or made to start nuclear fusion, and that was could a supernova start a chain reaction? Uh, that could trigger star formation. So could maybe it push matter around in some way and start, you know, creating a cloud, I guess, is the question. And then uh, Andrew wanted a slight clarification on the lensing. Were the difference in times of the images on the Einstein, uh, I forget what it was called, the Einstein image, was the difference in timing due to the angle of the star being different on the galaxy? The Einstein yeah. cross. Einstein cross. Thank you. Uh, let's go with the uh, let's go with the uh, well the angles first, and then we'll go back to the uh, chain reaction question. Right. So 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 as you say, so the um, exactly. So so all the images are about 0.3 arc seconds away from the center defined by the lensing galaxy. But but as as uh, yes, as the question I think implies. They are not all exactly, at, if they will be all exactly at the same angular separation, then there will be no time difference. But, but yes, so the answer is yes. The, and, the, and in fact, one of the challenges with this particular supernova is that it's so beautiful that it makes life a little bit complicated for us because the time differences are not going to be huge just because of all the images being relatively uh, about a compar very comparable angular you know, angular ang ang angle from the lensing galaxy, they're all about 0.3 arc seconds. Our measurement would have been a lot easier if one of the images was, let's say, one arc second away, because that image would be definitely coming a lot later than the other ones. But so, yeah, so the answer is yes, it has to do, the time delay, you know, depends on the angle, on the angle from the, from the center. Very good. Okay, what about Ryan's question on supernova? Could supernovae start a chain reaction that could trigger star formation? I think this is a more and general. That is, that is definitely a thing that people actively study when they do uh, star formation, uh, which is the supernova sets off a shock wave. These things explode at about 10% the speed of light. They throw a solar mass of material or more, if it's a core collapse supernova, out into the interstellar medium. And those shock waves actually do go through and, and cause things to collapse and start the next generation of star formation. In addition to which they're polluted by the metals that the supernova explosion makes. So the calcium, the gold, et cetera, the iron in the core of the earth, uh, these are all the remnants of a supernova explosion. They're all stardust. That's the, iron, the iron in your blood. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go have to go ahead and cut it off there because we are out of time. Um, I wanna I want to uh, I want to thank my guests for talking about their paper, Dr. Ariel Gubar from the University of Stockholm or Stockholm University, Dr. Mansi Kasilaval uh, from the Cal <laughs> California Institute of Technology, uh, Dr. Peter Nugent from University of California at Berkeley for take. Thank you guys very much for taking time out to talk about your yeah, research. Yeah, thank you very much. I learned a yeah, lot. This was really a great a great hang. I love it when I come away knowing more things. I'm I love the fact that now there's the, the elliptical galaxies and Type 1A supernovae are, are, 
I just I'm, I'm going to be thinking about that for a while. So thank you. Uh, thanks also thank you. to uh, Do- Dr. Carol Christian. Th- Carol, thank you for for putting all this together for us. This has been an awesome hangout. Uh, next week, folks, we're going to be talking uh, with if we got future in space. Hang out with Harley Thronson and Alberto Conti. We're going to be talking about the Trappist One system. This is a redo of a hangout where we had technical problems a few weeks ago. The guests have been kind enough to uh, rejoin us, so we'll be talking about Trappist One next week on future in space. So, on behalf of everybody that was in this hangout, I want to thank you all for watching, 